Good morning. I am Katrin Assenbacher and I'm heading the Monetary Policy Strategy Division at the ECB. I'm very happy to guide you to this, through this morning's session on central bank tiering, tiering systems and cryptocurrencies. We will have two papers. One is uh, presented by Maria Assunta Gianetti and is on money market and bank lending evidence from tiering adoption. And the second one will be presented by Simon Meyer, The Coming Battle of Digital Currencies. Both papers will have discussant. So the first discussion will be done by Diana Bonfim from Banco de Portugal, and the second one by Morten Beck from the Bank for International Settlements. So without much ado, I would like to uh, start the first paper. So Maria Sunta Gianetti will present the paper who has been done with ECB co-authors. Maria Sunta is a professor of finance at the Stockholm School of Economics, and she has been serving as associate editor of several international journals. So uh, she is a well-known name in the profession, and I'm happy to give the floor to Maria Sunta. So thanks a lot for uh, having me, and uh, I'm very sorry not to be able uh, to be there with you. This is a joint work with Carlo Attavilla, Miguel Bocincia, uh, Lorenzo Burlone, and Julian Schumacher. And uh, what we um, ask in this paper is uh, whether money market segmentation in uh, normal time can hamper the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So this is uh, partially a new question, meaning that uh, theoretically and uh, to a lower extent empirically, people have been analyzing whether uh, in uh, um, crisis time, when uh, the money market freeze, banks uh, that uh, have been uh, funding themselves uh, mostly through the money market uh, lend less. We consider we will consider uh, um, period of, of uh, in which banks were not particularly constrained because also the European Central Bank was uh, providing liquidity. And uh, what uh, we ask is whether the fact that some banks remain more in the periphery of the market may have constrained their lending policies. So, and uh, the idea here is that uh, access to uh, liquidity and uh, the um, having a lower, um, so having uncertainty in uh, the ability to access liquidity may um, lead to bank precautionary uh, behavior and uh, limit bank lending. So let me tell you how we attempt to um, ask this question. Basically, what we want is some shock that affects um, uh, the money market and how integrated the money market is. And for doing this, we use the introduction of the theory. Basically, the idea is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tiering gives uh, banks uh, incentives uh, to reallocate liquidity. The fact uh, that the banks have a stronger incentive uh, to trade in the money market uh, would uh, decrease the money market segmentation. Uh, and we ask uh, whether this matters uh, for uh, bank lending. Of course, in front of this audience, I do not expect to have to go in the uh, institutional details, but uh, basically the ECB awarded uh, each bank uh, exemption from the um, negative uh, interest rate. Of course, uh, there were banks that had more excess, uh, um, excess liquidity than the exemption, and there were banks with a new exemption. So we would expect that these would give banks incentive to trade. In the paper, we use the particular timing through which the tiering was introduced. 
So the first time that uh, um, the ECB has been uh, discussing uh, the tiering was uh, in uh, um, a speech of President Mario Draghi at uh, the end of March 2019. This was just uh, the hinting of the tiering that was, however, interpreted by the market uh, as uh, a credible uh, announcement. So a first effect of the tiering in this case uh, is uh, a positive wealth effect. So in principle, the tiering could have uh, affected the transmission mechanism through this positive wealth effect. We show that, uh, at least in our sample, this doesn't matter that much. There were other two steps through which the tiering was introduced in September 2019, all the um, feature through which the tiering would have been implemented were revealed, but the actual implementation happened at the end of October 2019. As I will show you, at least for the transmission mechanism, this is the crucial date. Why? Well, in the money market, the banks transact claims that have a very short maturity. Therefore, market participants had uncertainty about what would happen to the cost of um, borrowing in the inter uh, interbank market or ability to um, employ liquidity until that the very implementation. So we use uh, the rich data resources of the European Central Bank, and specifically Anacredit and uh, the money ma and MMSR. So let me uh, get directly into uh, the results uh, to give you an idea of what we find on the effect of the tiering on bank wealth and then on the transmission mechanism. So others that have explored the tiering before us have mostly um, focused on the wealth effect. And uh, what one would expect in the cross-section of bank returns if the uh, tiering um, indeed enhances bank wealth, we should expect that the banks that benefit the most from these exemptions, that is banks with more excess liquidity, experience higher valuations. And uh, this is uh, basically what we find for uh, the salient event of the introduction of the, of the tiering. That is uh, when the tiering was initially announced uh, and then when uh, the tiering was actually introduced uh, in uh, October um, 2019. But there is another important effect that is what we will focus mostly on. That is the fact that market segmentation in the money markets decreased. So what you observe here is that after the introduction of the tiering, banks with news allowances are able to borrow more in the money market. On the contrary, bank, banks with uh, unused allowances are uh, lending more. The effects uh, are uh, there both in the secured and unsecured part in the money market. Market segmentation probably implies something that we want to see in the extensive margin, that is a number of relationship as opposed to amount of borrowing. This cannot be done for the secured market because there is a central counterparty system. But if we look at the unsecured market, what you observe here is that in the first graph, banks with a news exemption are increasing the number of borrowing relationship that they have with other banks. Instead, the banks that with, uh, without a news exemptions, so that is, uh, these are the banks with uh, excess liquidity, are increasing the number of lending relationships with other banks. So on the extensive margin, this uh, again suggests uh, a reduction in market segmentation. <laughs> 
So we can uh, basically show these effects uh, also in uh, a multivariate setting in which we control for uh, a variety of fixed effects. But uh, what this multivariate analysis shows is bands that were more exposed to the Turing because they had a larger proportion of uh, unused exemptions are those that have higher net borrowing after the introduction of the tiering system. And um, so, and what we see is that, of course, as we would have expected, given the incentive to trade, these banks' excess liquidity increases after the implementation of the tiering. Somewhat interestingly, these banks also seem to hold relatively less government bonds after the introduction of the theory. Why? Well, probably the, um, they have a weaker incentive to hold this security because they, they um, being better integrated in the money market, they might not have to, um, they might not need this security, for instance, to access the TL, um, the, tar, uh, the TL, TRO. So let's look now at the transmission mechanism. So how can this shock affect the bank's willingness to lend? Well, there are at least three channels. One is the wealth effect, because we do observe that um, banks with higher excess liquidity that can ex ante, me, uh, that ex ante are expected by the market to make a better use of the exemption have higher valuations. But there are other, also other two mechanisms that can be at play. One is that uh, um, we expect negative interest rate policy to affect the transmission mechanism to, through a sort of hot potato channel, meaning that uh, since it's costly for banks uh, to hold on to the excess liquidity, these banks uh, would have uh, stronger incentives to lend. The fact that now some of the excess liquidity is exempted from negative rates might imply that uh, banks lend less. So to some extent, there might be concerns that the introduction of the tiering is uh, contractionary. The novel channel that uh, we introduce and test is uh, this money market uncertainty channel. That is uh, the reduction of the market segmentation increases, uh, um, reduces the bank's uncertainty to be able to uh, borrow short-term liquidity if needed and uh, my uh, in, uh, increase willingness uh, to lend. So it is uh, basically a reduction in precautionary behavior. So let's first try to see which of these mechanisms is at play. So what we are looking here is the volume of loan of a given bank to non-financial corporations in a given month. So here we are using an credit, so we will be able to absorb differences in demand with high dimensional fixed effects. And we will, um, and therefore, we will try to um, test whether the supply of credit related to different, uh, different cross-sectional characteristics of the banks matter. So what you observe here is that the, what we call the exposure to the implementation of the tiering that is uh, the proportion of unused exemption of uh, a bank seem to be um, positively related to the supply of credit after the implementation of the tiering. So we uh, um, evaluate whether the other two channels that I have just introduced are at play. 
So first of all, wealth effects. So the wealth effects are expected to be larger for banks with higher tiering savings. That is the banks that before the implementation of the um, tiering had enough liquidity to use all their unused exemptions. We don't see much related to these wealth effects. And uh, we also consider these hot potato channels. Uh, so does uh, uh, the introduction of the tiering and the fact that excess some excess liquidity is exempted from negative rate reduces uh, the incentive to lend for uh, high excess liquidity banks? Again, we find uh, no evidence of this hot potato effect. So what do we do in the text uh, of the analysis? Uh, in, in, basically, we explore how robust this finding that uh, banks that we find that exposed become better integrated in the money market lend more is. So what you observe here is that we can control for demands either by, inc uh, by including the interaction of industry location, size, and time fixed effect, assuming that all firms in this kind of clusters have a similar demand for credit, or we can also absorb a demand using a firm and month fixed effect. Across these specifications, we find that um, banks relative, that benefit more in terms of integration in the money market from the tiering increase their um, loan supply by around 4 or 7%. Now, you may think that what I have shown you so far is a bit of black box. I've been interpreting these banks that have relatively um, higher exemptions, so have a stronger incentives to borrow exposed in the money market as banks that were ex ante at the margin. And uh, this is, of course, uh, consistent with a lot of evidence. But can I test this better? So what we do here is we uh, look at uh, sample split and uh, cross-sectional variation between banks that face the ex-ante have higher borrowing rate in the money market. So if, uh, the idea is that if constraints in the ex-ante access of the money market really explain the lending behavior exposed, I should find that the effect is driven by banks with high news exemption with above median interest rate. And this is what you find across all the specification. Basically, for banks that face a relatively high interest rate in the money in the for borrowing in the money market before the implementation of the tiering, these are the precisely the banks that lend more to non-financial corporations after the introduction of the tiering. So the effects that we find are there not only for the quantity of credit, but also for uh, the loan maturity and the lending rate. So here, look at the uh, loan interest rate. Banks that have higher news exemptions before the implementation of the tiering and the face high borrowing rate in the money market are those that decrease the loan rate to a lower extent as possible. And these banks also extend the maturity of their uh, loans after the introduction of the theory. Now, what you might be wondering is, okay, there is a, a, a reduction in uh, precautionary behavior, presumably due to the reintegration of these mar uh, banks uh, in uh, the money market. But is this good or bad? Are these banks uh, taking uh, too much risk? 
or uh, are just uh, lending to uh, borrowers uh, that are credit worthy and work constrained example. So basically, we look at who gets more uh, credit. So what you see in this table is that we are uh, in column one to five, we are splitting the sample in above, below the median, based on the characteristics that you observe uh, here and that are presumably related to the riskiness of the borrower. Basically, we observe no evidence that a borrower with high default probability um, or uh, lower productivity are getting relatively more credit. So we don't think that we are capturing excess risk taking or zombie lending. Instead, what the column six to eight uh, confirm is that the banks that were relatively constrained ex ante, that is, for instance, a bank with low bank capital with uh, that, um, presumably less access to uh, the money uh, market, are those that extend relatively more credit after the implementation of the theory. So let me um, conclude. What does this paper show? Well, the paper shows in the context of the introduction of the tiering that money market segmentation can actually really hamper the transmission mechanism of monetary policy and um, is a uh, and that uh, the introduction of the tiering seemed to have benefited the, the transmission mechanism, uh, reducing the most constrained banks' uh, precautionary behavior. Thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, I look uh, forward to Diana's comments. Thank you very much for your presentation, Maria Sunta. So I then would like to give the floor to Diana for her comments, and you, as a discussant, you have 10 to 15 minutes for your discussion. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation to, to discuss this, this great paper and participating in, in the conference. I'm really sorry I cannot be there today, but, uh, but it would be infeasible to travel uh, the, the, the today. But it was still great to have a chance to go um, that, to go deeply through this, through this paper that Maria Sunta just, uh, just presented. So, so I think the presentation was, was very clear, but at the same time, it's it's a very dense paper, very polished with a lot of results. So let, let me try to, to take one step back and, and make things even, even more simple than, than what Maria Sante did. So I guess everyone here knows that uh, in 2019, the ECB implemented this tiering system on excess reserves. And, and if we go back to the explicit statement on why this was done, the goal was explicitly to support the bank-based transmission of monetary policy, but at the same time, making sure that the, the negative rate environment was still contributing to, to an accommodative stance of monetary policy. So how was this actually achieved? So the idea behind implementation is as simple as it could be. So you have these excess reserves that at the time were being remunerated or, or actually charged 0.4 interest rates, and so the idea after after October 2019 was, okay, let's make an exemption, let's allow for an exemption. And so the amount of excess reserves that would be up to six times the minimum requirements would, would get a 0% interest rate and everything else would continue to have this negative uh, DFR attached. So what does this mean? Let's think about different examples, different settings, banks with different conditions to see how exactly this would matter for them. So let's think of a bank that has 1 billion euros of excess reserves and half of that, those excess reserves would be subject to the exemption. So what this means is that instead of having to pay 4 million euros uh, per year to have these, deposit, these deposits parked at the ECB, now this bank would have to pay only half of that. Okay, so this, this kind of alleviates pressure on the banks and exerts this wealth channel that Maria Santa described and the, it, the channel that actually the, the literature has focused more on. Let's think now about a bank where, okay, 
that the, their excess reserves by coincidence are fully covered by the exemption, well, that then this bank is now able to deposit everything at the ECB at the zero interest rate. But then where things become much more interesting, and I think this is where the, the, all the, the empirical strategy of the paper really contributes and allows us to understand some of the puzzles that could exist, is to think about these other banks, banks that wouldn't have enough excess reserves to meet the exception, the exemption. So these banks actually have some room to increase their excess reserves and, 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 and get the 0% interest rate instead of being charged to do so. So having laid out the, the very simple pricing mechanism, how, how does this actually achieve the, the bank-based transmission of monetary policy? And so there's these three channels that, that were just described in, in Marison's presentation. So there's the first one, the wealth, the bank's net wealth. So for the banks that have this excess liquidity, of course, now they have this a positive impact on their net wealth, and this should encourage the banks to lend more. At the same time, there's two other channels. Okay, the second one is, is what Maria Sonza just labeled the hot potato liquidity channel. So basically what this means, sorry, what this means is that the higher value that excess liquidity now has might actually now encourage these banks that had unused exemptions to increase their reserves and this would make them lend less. But at the same time, there's a another effect that, that could make these banks with excess liquidity to actually lend more. And this is exactly where the paper focuses on, is the argument that by improving the functioning of the money market through the reduction of uncertainty, this might encourage that the banks that were previously constrained to actually now lend more because they face less uncertainty and actually they can borrow through the interbank markets in, 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 in a much clearer way. So when we go through through the results that the paper delivers on, on all these three mechanisms, so sure, there's some evidence of this positive wealth effect, so even though it doesn't seem to be the major driving force, but, but results that have been shown for other um, adaptive restrictions seem to be at work. But where I think it's, it's more interesting is to see how these second and third channels actually interact. And so this possibility that the tiering was contractionary that, that is not at work at all in this setting. What, what happens is that there's a reallocation of liquidity to the banks that had the news exceptions, and these banks lend more. And the reason this happens is due to this improved functioning of the money market. So this, this is a, a very polished, complete uh, paper. I, I think, I mean, um, many things uh, were, were covered in the presentation and many, many more on, are in the paper. So at this stage, my, my comments are going to be kind of at a relatively broad level and actually thinking about future work and things that could, could be done. So first I will talk a little bit about, more about these mechanisms, then about local versus aggregate effects, then about how exactly was the money market functioning, and then about, I mean, what are the long-term implications of all this? So, so when it comes to the mechanisms at work, right, we had these second and third channels, the hot potato and, 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 and the one related to uncertainty, okay? So the way, if, if we think about these channels, they're going to affect maybe two different types of banks, and this is what the last tables that were shown tried to address. So for the banks that were possibly unconstrained, they might have chosen not to have the same amount of reserve, of excess reserves as they could because, I mean, what would be the point? That would be something that would be charged a 0.4% interest rate. So these banks might out now face this opportunity and think, okay, now I can in increase these reserves and, and, and to do that, to have more money deposited at the ECB, these banks would lend less. And these would be the banks that would have somehow the possibility to choose which level of reserves they had, and they were actively choosing not to have the, as much reserves as, as possibly that they could have now with the exemptions. Where things are perhaps more interesting and relevant is for the constrained banks. It's for the banks that didn't have excess reserves because they really didn't have the space to do that. These banks were somehow constrained in their access to, to, to liquidity. And, and so now that the money market is working in a better way, these banks can lend and, 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 and they can borrow from other banks or for, and with these excess funds, now they can lend to the economy, okay? And as it's written in the paper, which one of the two mechanisms is going to prevail is really an empirical question. So the results in the paper are, are really suggestive of the idea that it's the second effect that dominates much more on average. 
And in the, in the last table that we saw, uh, there's a great effort to, to look into this heterogeneity and to the different conditions that the banks face. I still think that it, it would be interesting to, to be able to say something more explicit, which I think is already there in the paper, but I don't think that it's so much explicitly discussed, is looking specifically to these unconstrained banks, how, do they, how did they react? And, and so I think the results are very explicit for the constrained banks, and, and possibly this is the mechanism really at work, but, but the way the results are stated are much more subtle for the unconstrained banks, and I think it would be very interesting to see how these banks that had room for a more strategic reaction, how did these actually change? Then I, I think it, 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 it would also be interesting to, um, to, to think a little bit about local versus aggregated facts. Okay, so I, I mean, as you would expect from a paper written by, by this team of co-authors, empirical strategies were really very carefully executed. The causal interpretation is, is, is out there. But I still, I mean, given that it's a paper with so much policy relevance, I mean, especially for, for, for all of us here in the audience today, I think that in some parts, having a bigger picture of the effects, even if we have to, to let go a little bit in terms of the, the benefits of uh, precise identification, I think it could be helpful. And, and there are specific questions where I, where I felt that I would be curious to learn more about these more aggregate implications of, of, of what happened uh, after tiering was implemented. So, for instance, one thing that it wasn't clear for me when reading the paper is actually what happened to total liquidity in the banking system, okay? Did actually the, 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 the entire liquidity increase or, or, or maybe not? I, I, I wouldn't see a reason why it would, but this is actually not shown. So, if the liquidity doesn't increase, then the additional lending would come from reallocation. Okay, and so this means it's a relative effect. It's okay, some banks lend more, but perhaps at the expense that other, other banks are lending less. And so while, while it's very interesting to see that, okay, when we compare the different banks and the before and after the different announcements, we see the effects, it would be interesting to have a broader picture and to understand a little bit more about this reallocation. I think there's a lot of evidence going into this, but seeing it in, in a more explicit way, I think it would be very interesting. Another thing is, of course, we have much better data on, on, on corporate loans, right? And especially now with any credit, we can do this very impressive analysis and, 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 and really go deep and understand what is going on in terms of how the banks are financing the firms. But this is not the only thing that, that banks do. And so looking into other asset categories where, of course, I mean, we cannot go as, as strict on fixed effects on the, or even granularity, but still, I think it would be interesting to have a broader understanding of the implications of the tiering. And so looking into what happened to mortgages, what happened to consumer loans on which the, the TLTRO targets were actually very explicit. And so what happened in these credit markets as well. I would also be curious to understand what happens to government bond holdings. So one thing that government bond holdings are always or almost always a control in all the regressions in the paper and very often they come up as significant for many of the outcomes so this suggests that something might be going on here in terms of banks decisions of of holding government bonds and while it's important to control for that i wonder if it would be interesting to analyze that in itself if there's something interesting happening through through a channel linked to the sovereign then, then, then my third comment is about um, the, the, how the money market was working at the time. So here I think that the paper really offers a very important contribution. So we don't have many papers looking into how money markets influence bank lending, but those that we have, they're focused on crisis periods. And so this paper really offers a, a very important angle by looking at what happens when the money market is actually not frozen. The thing is, it wasn't frozen, but it wasn't normal either, right? So as the author said, that the money market was dormant in, 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 in some segments at the time. So I think it would be interesting to, to think about how special the setting is, right? And so how many banks were effectively constrained and, and for how many banks and, and in which segments were things actually working as smoothly as they could be in normal times. And, 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 and this relationship analysis somehow helps us on that, but, but but perhaps we could learn even more. And for instance, one way to learn more would be to also extend the analysis to other episodes. For instance, in 2016, the tiering had already been mentioned in one of the press conferences. 
So it would I would be very curious to see, of course, for, we don't have all the data for that period, but some of the data we do. So what actually happened? I mean, what, what, once the, the, the topic was discussed, given that the Draghi meant reference had so much effect in 2019, just a pure mention of that in a speech, did the same thing happen in 2016? Also, uh, trying to understand how money markets and banks reacted in the euro area after announcements in other jurisdictions related to Turing in Switzerland or Denmark, also figuring out how TLTR announcements changed some of these outcomes. And so the, the final comment I, I have is, 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 is about, I mean, the, the longer term implications of all this. So when you read the paper, uh, the, the results are all very positive. And so, uh, I mean, given that uh, we're at the ECB and we all contributed to this decision, it's, it's very good to see that this seems to be the case. But at the same time, I think it would be interesting to, uh, to, to, to go a bit further and think about the medium term effects. Of course, this in terms of identification becomes more challenging, but I think it would be definitely be interesting. And I think one thing that, well, surely for future work, but trying to understand what happened when the DFR now became zero again at, at earlier this year, I think this would be very interesting to explore as well. I mean, and to, to see what happened uh, in money markets and how that changed uh, lending decisions as well. So, so summing up, I think, that, I mean, this is a great paper. There's there's a very impressive evaluation of, of the multiple effects that the Turing could have looking into these different channels. Um, there's really no stone left in turn. Uh, so all the channels are debated and, and evaluated. The data is impressive, of course, and the results are very positive. I just have some, 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 some uncertainty about, okay, Maybe if we have a longer term analysis perspective, are the results still so positive? What are the broader, more aggregate implications of these in other dimensions of banks balance sheets? And, and also how special the setting is and how can we extend it further to think about other settings in, 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 in which this could work. But thank you so much and, and best of luck for the paper. Thank you very much for the discussion. So I would first like to give Maria Sunta the opportunity to react to the comments. And then afterwards, I would like to open up the floor for questions. And I would like to particularly invite also the online participants to submit their questions via the chat. So they will be read out by me. So I will receive them and uh, give them uh, to the, the author. And yeah, but first Maria Sunta. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the excellent comments, uh, Diana. Uh, we can work on them for uh, months. And um, what we um, try to say, and I think this is uh, the first evidence, uh, is that uh, market segmentations uh, seem to matter for uh, bank lending. And uh, these segmentations are, to some extent, uh, a feature of the euro area because it's the money market of uh, several countries with uh, that has a bit of different features, for instance, from uh, the Swiss money market or perhaps even the uh, U.S. money markets. And uh, I think this is, uh, to some extent, the first evidence that. Um, uh, I think it is uh, correct that the ECB and policymakers are concerned about uh, this segmentation. But it would be indeed uh, interesting uh, to look at uh, the money market effects uh, of uh, the um, July uh, 20, uh, 26 uh, policy decisions. And I agree that we should look a bit more at uh, the aggregate uh, effects. And there is also Carlo there, I understand, uh, perhaps also my other co-authors. So, so I don't know whether they want to add uh, something. That's. But I look, look forward for more um, questions. No, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Diana, for the for the comments, uh, and uh, <clears throat> they were all very useful. Uh, as Bessinta was saying, probably uh, looking at the, you had a very fair point with that I was discussing with Julian here, that is also uh, present in the room. Uh, which is what, what will happen to all this segmentation and money market dynamics now that uh, yields or rates policy rates are. Uh, zero or both zero. So whether there is this detrenchment of the effect that we found. So this is of course something we can uh, look, but at the same time, of course, the paper is really on the effect of segmentation. So this is really when uh, in a stressful period like one that we were in, probably this was uh, 
the measure. Concerning your other point, probably very quickly on the sovereign bond, and probably you were hinting at potential carry trade effects uh, coming out from uh, the, this uh, wealth effect. Uh, let's let's be clear. So um, over the period, actually, the sovereign holdings of banks were decreasing. So we will never have some substitution effect between lending and uh, and sovereign bond or money uh, that were uh, <clears throat> that were at disposal of banks because of the tearing and sovereign bond. Uh, so this would actually suggest that there was no carry trade activity coming from uh, the the exercise that uh, Maria Suta said. But I don't know if Julian you want to add anything. Okay. Okay. But but thanks a lot for for the for, for the discussion. So any further questions in the room? Sebastian? Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting paper. Um, and thanks a lot for presenting. I want to, to go into a bit of the comments that also Diana made. I was wondering whether you can, can explain a bit more how you identify the market segmentation that is before the introduction of tiering, no? Because of the, the paper uh, tries to exploit um, the reduction in market segmentation that is then triggered by the two-tier system was wondering, I mean, market segmentation sounds to me that there is some kind of constraint in the market. And if I believe correctly from your regression results, that is also related to, or you identify that by having higher borrowing rates in the money market. Um, but what you see when tiering is introduced is that indeed these trades uh, start to happen, but at the same time that average money market rates or that they don't respond. So it doesn't seem that these rates are uh, indeed much higher. So that to me doesn't really sound like the market was constrained beforehand. Instead, well, there was just not a big incentive to trade because there was a lot of liquidity in the market and now we have introduced an arbitrage opportunity. So I was wondering how you interpret this that these, the money market rates basically don't respond, that these banks that you identify as constrained in the money market before the introduction of tiering, they actually trade at the average rate that all other banks are also trading afterwards. So this is uh, a good question, and um, to me, the fact mm, so the tiering was uh, designed in a way that uh, rates would not respond because uh, otherwise um, the negative interest rate policy would be no longer there. But uh, mm, indeed, is a bit uh, puzzling that. Uh, on average, uh, these uh, banks uh, are uh, borrowing uh, exactly at the same rate as before. Said that, uh, it is um, a fact that the uh, banks uh, with uh, less excess liquidity and unused exemptions uh, had uh, much fewer relationships uh, in uh, the money markets. And uh, as soon as uh, the shock happens, uh, these uh, banks uh, have uh, more uh, links. So the way in which we interpret this reintegration and a change in which the money market is working is basically that some banks establish more links and these banks are the ones that happen to have more unused exemptions ex ante and happen to have um, uh, higher borrowing interest rate ex ante. And I'm sure that Julian can answer this type of question much better. So if, we, uh, if Julian wants to add something, that would be great. Okay, no, thanks for the question, which is actually very important, I think. Um, and Maria Zunta already made, uh, made the important point that, of course, the system was designed in a way that the average rate indeed would change, because otherwise that would have sort of undermining the, 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 the policy stance uh, per se. But uh, at the same time, what's, what if you look at, so if you go one level lower, basically, and you look at the rates at which different groups of types of banks were trading in the market, then you do see this sort of segmentation. And we actually also document this, this in the paper uh, which shows that the, that the two groups of banks were in fact trading at uh, at different rates. Now, the average rate didn't change. That's how the system was designed. But still, there was already there there was still this 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 element of segmentation between these two separate groups. And by bringing back basically um, one group of uh, or this group of banks that got this additional uh, incentive to 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 trade, uh, therefore also you know that. Is, is to me then evidence also that the segmentation was resolved to some extent. Now in the regressions then um, on the uh, on the effect on the on the real effects or on the lending effect so to speak, uh, there we 
We try to approximate this by, by dividing the banks again into groups um, that have particularly high rates and particularly low rates. And, uh, and also there we see that those banks that ex ante had higher rates, so that were in this group, let's say, of, of at least um, you know, paying a higher price for their activity in the market, that there we also see stronger effects. So this also goes, I think, in the same direction then in the end of showing that by reintegrating those banks into the market, by giving them these additional incentives, even at a higher price, let's say, uh, that also then led to these, to these, uh, to these stronger effects in terms of their, their lending performance. Okay, thank you very much. So we are just on time with uh, the first paper.